happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. <laughs> a lot to talk about, lots in the news. Uh, the J&J &J vaccine will no longer be available in the United States. About 19 million people received it. There are 31 million doses that were delivered and have already <laughs> expired unused, and so they're going to throw those out. Mostly, remember, they, they had the complication of uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia, TTS, and so they haven't been used very much. The WHO has recommended that new COVID vaccines target XBB. <laughs> Duh! Uh, you know, who needs the WHO for that? That's the dominant circulating uh, strain, and we know that immunity from the other uh, infections hasn't really been very, very good. So in, in case you're wondering what this sounds like, it sounds a little bit like the flu, right? So now we're, you know, based on the strain that's available, best guess. So I uh, will have a vaccine for that. So as I've been saying to everybody who's been asking me, well, let's wait to the fall. If XBB is still the circulating uh, dominant strain, then that's probably the right one to get vaccinated against. Also in the news, WHO says MPOX is no longer a global health emergency. Interesting. Uh, the CDC just reported that the vaccine against MPOX was very, very effective. 75% for one uh, shot and 86% for two shots. So the CDC is recommending if you're, uh, even though the, the threat is gone, there's been some outbreaks we'll, we'll talk about in a second, but they recommend that uh, people at risk get vaccinated. Remember, MPOX is endemic in Africa. There's usually around 100 cases a year, but in the United States, we had that big peak over, this, over the uh, fall and, and winter. Cases have declined uh, by 99%, but in total, there were 33,000 cases in the United States. The vast majority of these are associated with skin-to-skin -skin contact with men who have sex with men. But there was a recent outbreak in Chicago, and just to show you that outbreak, uh, you can see the huge number of cases that we had last summer into the fall, and then this is the outbreak now. It's only 28 cases, but obviously there's still virus around. This is MPOX. So CDC is recommending if you have risk or you're, you know, potential risk, you should get your, finish out your vaccines. Other viruses in the news besides the MPOX? Huge avian flu outbreak this year. Uh, in the United Kingdom, there are more than 60 species that have been infected and over 50,000 wild birds have died already. This is H5N1. In the United States, uh, over, almost 60 million poultry have been affected by the flu since January of 2022. There have been outbreaks in 47 states and it's beginning to show up in mammals. There have been a few uh, number of pet cats that have been reported, which of course Lily told me they deserve it. Uh, but, you know, that right now there are four vaccine trials ongoing. Uh, hopefully we'll have some answers uh, about the vaccination opportunities by June. You know, there's a real interest in potentially vaccinating uh, the poultry because it's a real problem. I mean, it's de devastating that industry. Risk to humans remains low, but of course we've talked about it all the time. Even if it's low now, you always worry about some mutation that allow it to jump between people. But we'll keep it. Keep uh, watching that. That's a very important outbreak that's uh, currently, as I said, in birds. So for COVID, um, you know, we no, we no longer follow case rates because they're impossible to really determine anything. But if you follow hospitalizations or deaths, they're both beginning to they're continuing to fall, which is good. This is the data for hospitalizations. You can see it's down. It's not zero. It's still, uh, you know, several hundred people, but it's not zero. But again, look at wastewater. This is a really interesting. These are all the reports, all the uh, places that cite, that, that report uh, to the CDC. And the, the black line just shows you fewer and fewer sites are reporting. But orange and red represents, uh, orange is almost a 50% uh, increase, and uh, uh, red is over 100% increase. So there are about 42% of the sites are reporting increases in, in the virus, in COVID. And if you look specifically where there are these dots, I'm trying to make it more clear for you by looking at the map. The orange ones are the ones that are zero to 100% increase, or, I mean, up to 100% increase, and the reds are uh, over 100%. You can see mostly it's in that zero to, to uh, 80% or 100% increase, and they're mostly in the Midwest, one place on Long Island, I know what they're doing there, Western North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, 
and uh, place in New Mexico. So uh, that's what's going on from the wastewater perspective. The best news of all, of course, is that the dominant strain remains XBB. So that's excellent. That doesn't mean there's, we can't see another variant emerge, but you know, XBB remains the dominant strain. As long as that remains the dominant strain and doesn't do any significant mutation, people who get it should be immune to it for at least six to eight months, and hopefully we'll have a vaccine for this strain in the fall. Uh, and in terms of uh, potential vaccination development, we've been talking about having a, a, a nasal vaccine. There was a study out of WashU that looks at an adenoviral vector uh, nasal uh, spray that takes the the spike protein of the BA5 mutation. That, that the BA5 variant is not that uh, dominant in circulation now. It was about uh, about a year ago, and it looks at two different conformations: the prefusion and then the surface stabilized form of the the, uh, the spike protein. So the spike protein flops around right before it fuses. It goes into a different conformation. So they used uh, two different conformations to develop this, um, this uh, uh, vaccine. And then they gave it uh, in the upper airway to uh, animals, and this was in mice and hamsters. And what they found was that you, they did not develop a lot of immunity, uh, systemic immunity. They mostly got immunity that protected in the upper airways and, and uh, uh, the lungs. But interestingly enough, it did confer protection against the BQ1 variant, which is, was circulating right before XBB, and the XBB variant. So even though it's not directed to those areas, the, the upper airway uh, vaccination did protect mice and hamsters from getting upper airway disease and lung disease. So that suggests that that route of uh, administration might actually be more efficacious than we think, even though it doesn't generate a lot of systemic immunity. But it's really interesting, so hopefully there'll be more uh, developments around the uh, nasal uh, route of vaccination. There was also one really interesting study in Nature this past week. You know, as we look back on the, um, uh, on the pandemic, there should be a lot of papers that come out that sort of explore who got, you know, what, what the risk factors were. And this is one of those. This is a, this is a study that looked at DNA from 24,000 people who had COVID and require treatment in intensive care. So these are people who are really susceptible to getting very sick. And the investigators, and this is amazing, there were 2,000 authors on this paper. I don't the, the, the authors, <laughs> it was just as much as the paper. Anyway, uh, they found 49 sequences that are associated with uh, becoming critically ill, and those sequences, uh, many of them are new. There were 16 that were new. Many of them are involved in immune regulation, particularly inflammatory activation. And what they found was the, uh, these sequences often stimulated immunity that, would, uh, that could damage the lungs and the upper airways. And then they found, because of that, they looked at the, the pathways and they found a number of druggable targets. Uh, so that's really interesting. So there may be ways to take this kind of study and, and figure out uh, potential drugs that uh, can be useful against COVID and severe COVID the next time. And then I want to finish. <laughs> I want to finish the science on one point. Uh, this is a really fascinating study. A lot of people ask me, you know, when, how, what is artificial intelligence going to do to, uh, you know, is it, to help medicine? And this was a really interesting one. It took, um, uh, uh, it took 195 randomly drawn patient questions from social media uh, and took a number of licensed healthcare professionals to answer those questions. And then it looked at uh, chat GPT answering the same question. So human doctor answering questions that were posed on social media versus chat GPT. And what they found was that the chat bot was <laughs> much better than the physicians. 3.6 times higher prevalence of good or very quality good responses for the chat bot and 10 times more empathetic. So we doctors, we have to work on our empathy bit because chat GPT may replace us, at least in terms of answering questions. So this has been an incredibly busy week, and so I want to end up this week with a number of shout-outs. And I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office upon which I am about to enter. So help me God. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Ryan Keller.
We had a military commissioning ceremony, ceremony for two of our medical uh, graduates. Ryan Rush! Beginning their medical careers as active members in the U.S. Air Force. Congratulations to them. Dr. Gupta, will you please join me? Dr. Sanjay, yes. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity in accordance with good medical practice. I will foster the honor and noble traditions of the medical profession. We also celebrated graduation with more than 250 students from the School of Medicine, the Graduate School of Biomedical Sciences, and the Genetic Counseling Program in the uh, School for Health Professions. And it's great to have all, over uh, 1,500 people attended. It was really wonderful. We held an event to commemorate the beginning of construction of the new Lilly and Roy Cohen Tower, a collaborative space for medical education and research scheduled to open in 2026. I'm incredibly appreciative to uh, the Board of Trustees who really helped uh, start the fundraising for this. And a special shout out to the Cullen Foundation, the Cullen Trust for Healthcare, and the Cullen Trust for Higher Education for their lead gift of $30 million for the building. Uh, and it's a beautiful building. Finally, uh, as you know, this weekend is Memorial Day. Uh, it marks uh, an occasion when we take time to remember those who have died while serving the United States military, to remember their family and friends who were impacted by their deaths. While this also marks the beginning of summer, I hope everyone will take a moment to focus on these incredibly brave uh, soldiers and families who have dedicated their lives to the defense of our country. Have a wonderful Memorial Weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week.